Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome our next speaker, our next presentation by Rabbanit Shani Terrigan, who's a Yoetzer Halacha and a fantastic teacher in Tanakh and a Tamidah Chachaman of her own right. I don't want to take time in spending too much time in, in an introduction, but it's really an honor to have Rabbanit Terrigan, who's been a guest at Young Israel Century City in the past. Um, we've asked uh, Shani to be able to address us on Tanakh, which it, the topic is Megillat Root, the timely and the timeless. Please give your undivided attention to Shani Terrigan. Rabbi Maskin, thank you, and thank all of you for joining in at this Yom Iyun, in honor and in preparation of Chag HaShavuot. And as one Chazal teach us always begins with Chavot HaAchsanya, here it's not just the Zoom platform, but really everyone in the LA community and Israel Century City. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be back having an opportunity to prepare together and to explore this timely and really timeless message in Tanakh. We're going to begin by even thinking about Sefer Ruth, which is quite a strange story to be canonized by virtue of the fact that we open it up and we don't even find God's name mentioned so much. Whereas Chazal will deliberate whether or not the book of Esther should be canonized by virtue of the fact that Hashem's name doesn't appear. Here we're going to see that God is brought into the picture, both at the beginning of the story, when we hear that God is the one who provides for food, and then by the end of the story, wherein the neighbors of Naomi are going to comment that Hashem is the one, God provides both for food and for children. But in the middle, this really does seem to be a very, I'm going to say, hackneyed story. People in the field acting nice one to the other. And yet Chazal certainly see this as paradigmatic, not just to teach us about a timely and timeless message of Chesed, but we're going to see all the more. So we're going to explore together as we take a look at the story of Ruth and appreciate it anew from a very textual perspective. We're going to get started with at the very beginning of the story as we look, Anna, here we go, as we look at the, uh, firstly, the introduction known as the exposition of the story, but also what our sages and various commentators have to say about the characters and some of the motifs within the story of Ruth. So together, as uh, we first ask ourselves, what is this doing here? We always put it back in its contextual and historical context. Chazal teach us that Shmuel Hanavi, the same author of the books of Samuel and uh, the book of Shuftim, authored this. And therefore, when we open up at the very beginning of Ruth and we're thinking, this is going to be placed in a particular context, if you want to understand the timeless message of Ruth, first go back to the period of the judges that Chazal teach us are not just the notorious times where we know the famous statement of Ahi by Yemi Mahim, A Melech B Israel, it's a time of terrible anarchy. Everyone is doing whatever they want. And particularly by the end of the Sefer, the book of Shoftim, we hear of three notorious stories in particular the story of Pesel Micha, distorted worship of God. We hear the story of Pilegish Begiva, a horrific story of adultery and abuse of a, of a woman. And then we hear of civil war, of Shvichut Amim, the three cardinal sins that basically depict the undermining of Jewish society. And therefore, Chazal tell us, Shmuel is telling you that if you really want to, uh, want to understand the universal message of Ruth, go back. Go back and do your homework. Go back to Sefer Shoftim and try to appreciate the messages there. This is a time, Sheshavtu et Shoftehem, wherein the people themselves were judging their judges and they deserved it because, I, Lishoftav Shetrichim Lihishafet, it was a time period where the judges were not necessarily good leaders, certainly not in the religious sense. And therefore, we, we're not surprised when we open up Sefer Ruth and we hear Vahi Ra'av Ba'aretz, a famine in Tanakh, that is always a depiction of a rift between ourselves and God. And therefore, the story of these characters bring us back to Sefer Shuftim. So very quickly, what did we find there? We found the first story of a man who steals money from his, his own mother. And then his mother says, whoever returns the money, shall be blessed and sure enough her son returns the money and she says oh you're so blessed i think we would all mock or really laugh at this distorted education and saying that your son is blessed because he stole and then returned the money and then as she promised the son then is going to dedicate this to god but keeping in mind that there's a mishkan there's a tabernacle in shiloh 
Instead, he builds a distorted form of God. He builds an idol, basically, right across the road, Anna, the area, the main area leading to the Mishkan. And this is where they're also going to be the warriors of Dan. They're going to be called on Shehail, who will go and basically destroy this form of Avodah Zarah, only to then destroy settlements in the north as well because they didn't properly conquer their western area. Notice then that people are worshiping God however they want. In each one of the stories, we're going to see that there is a man from Yehuda and a man from Ephraim, the two main central areas of Eretz Yisrael, the two tribes that brought glory to the people in the initial conquest of the land, they're not living up to their potential. These are going to be the people who are going to lead in a negative fashion. And we also find in each one of the stories, a wandering lady teaching us that people are not providing for the Levim, which means that they don't have proper education in the land of Israel. And we all know that when you don't pay your educators, then the level of not just intelligence, but morality is also going to decline. During the same time period as well, there's a man who, from Ephraim who takes up Hilegesh from Beit Lechem Yehudam. Please remember these areas. Here we find that people aren't even settled in their own lands. They're not marrying within their tribes. Families, tribes are literally breaking apart. And he takes this concubine only to not properly provide for her. So she has to go and prostitute herself to someone else and then goes back to her father. And ultimately the man comes to get her, but he abuses her, allows her to be abused by the people of Binyamin and then dismembers her body as he casts it and sends it off to all the different tribes of Israel, stirring a tremendous civil war. A civil war where we find that the people of Binyamin who were responsible for this crime are going to be utterly destroyed. These Ansheikhail warriors who are going to be almost nearly annihilated. And then the people scream out to God, God, you're the one who created this parrot to be Israel. You caused this terrible breakdown amongst the people of Israel. And once again, we want to laugh and at the same time cry with the generation at the time. You're the ones who caused the civil war. You're the ones who literally committed this genocide. And now you're blaming God. And how do they solve the problem of murder? Well, let's kill more people. We'll kill the people of Yavish Galad and take the woman. And then we'll allow the leftovers of Binyamin to literally just take our daughters because we're so religious. We're so from chas v'shalom that they should take our daughter, that we should give them our daughters. Let them take them. Again, the breakdown of family, the breakdown of respect of women, the breakdown, in other words, of society represented through these three cardinal sins. And then we're going to see the story of Ruth. We're going to see how through Ruth, there are going to be just a few characters who will change the entire zeitgeist, who are going to change the tide of the generation from a time of monarchy. We're going to see the antithesis, both textually and conceptually, from anarchy to monarchy, how just a few people with their acts of kindness, with their personalities, going a little bit above and beyond, are going to be able to build families, to build homes, and ultimately create monarchy. The story is not just about the genealogy of David, for if that was true, if the only reason we read this on Shavuot is because it's the birthday and yard site of David HaMalach, then we can just skip to the fourth and final chapter, but it's not. It's about, as Rabbi Zeira tells us, not to teach us Tuma and Tahara, not to teach us Isur and Heter, Lama Nechtiva, and why do we read this on Shavuot? To teach you the most timely message. It really should not be limited to this time period. It's about Kama Sachar Tov Chasadim. And generally, when we're in elementary school, we hear that Ruth is about Chesed. And we know that we open up Shavuot. And we hear that Shavuot is the time of the harvesting of the wheat. This is where in Vayikra, Parachav Gimel, we just learned this in Parshat Emor. This is the time that we have to be extra sensitive to uh, the underdogs of society, to the indigent who live amongst us. This is where we have to make sure that we take care of them in our fields. And therefore, we read Ruth's story of chesed to remind ourselves to be a little more effusive in that regard, to remind ourselves of the chesed of the fields. But that's not what Chazal tell us. It's not a, just about kindness. You can open up the stories of Avram Avinu to Rivka Imenu and see plenty of stories of kindness. We don't need this story to be included in our Sifrei Kodesh because of kindness. What does this story teach us? This story is about the rewards of Gomlei Chesed. But that's strange. 
because we know that on one hand, chesed, as Chazal teach us in Masechet Sota, is really a form of imitatio day. The entire Torah is about chesed, explains Rav Simlai. After all, it begins with God providing for clothing for Adam and Chava. It ends with God providing for a burial place for Moshe Rabbeinu. The whole Torah is chesed. What's so special about the story of Ruth? It's about the rewards of chesed. It's about a matatio day, recognizing the kindnesses of God, imitating those acts of God. God, but all the more so. What does it mean, the rewards of chesed? Well, the Rambam tells us we use that term very loosely. Sometimes we compare it with mishpat and staka, but no, mishpat are the laws, sometimes social laws indeed, but that's mishpat. Staka is about literally giving things. Again, whether it's charity itself, again, that's staka, acts of righteousness that we perform to, to others. Chesed, he said, can be used in two regards, either either to give to someone who you're not expecting anything from, someone to whom you're not responsible at all. You know, at that little, that teenager who's waiting in Israel at the Trempiada, and you know that you're never going to see them again. That's chesed. If you stop, knowing that there's nothing that they can really do for you, and the other is to go above and beyond even when one does perform a kindness. The Rambam says the first chesed, the first chesed that we hear about, that's really the chesed of Ruth. That is the more zamanin chesed. When you perform a chesed the way that God performs the, uh, the way that God performs chesed, namely without receiving anything in, in return. This is going to be imperative for us to appreciate this timeless message. A message of one who performs kindness, not thinking that they're going to receive anything. And the Torah says, or the story of Ruth teaches, don't place this in a vacuum in history and make sure that you see generations to come how these are the people who ultimately are going to build Malchut. Did Boaz know, Chazal tell us, had Boaz known that his chesed would be recorded, he would have gone even greater, would have given peace to Etzirut. But no, he doesn't think, he doesn't do this in order to, be, to have his story recorded. It's not about his, uh, his acts of chesed for the sake of anything in return. Does Ruth know that she is going to be transformed to the mother of royalty? Certainly not. Does Naomi ever think that she will have a name that will be perpetuated forever? No. When you perform chesed, you don't think of the ripple effects. But this is what the story of Ruth is teaching us. And let's see to what extent. We open up the story and we hear that the first milam mancha, the light motif that's mentioned, is actually one of shame. We hear the terminology of there's a man, what do you know, from Beit Lechem Yehuda, the same areas of the time period of the Shoftim. And he's called an Ephrati, like the people of Ephraim, he's cosmopolitan, which already gives us a sense, uh-oh, is he living up to uh, the positive aspects of Yehuda and Ephraim or not? And unfortunately we hear that he's going to abandon the country. He's going to abandon the people. V'shem ha'ish eli melech. V'shem ishto na'omi. V'shem shneim banav machlon v'chilyon efratim mi beit lachem yudah. V'yavos de mo'av ayu sham v'yamat alim melech ish na'omi v'tashahir hi'u shnei v'neha. V'yesu la nashem ha'v'yot shem achator pa v'shem ha'shemit rut v'yishvu sham ka'eser shanim. Notice the terminology that we have no less than seven times. A perfect mila mancha. According to Martin Buber, the uh, essence of what a light motif is all about, shame, sham, shame, it's all about a name. And it's not just about the names that we're supposed to be paying attention to, whether Naomi, who's going to say later on that she's no longer Naama, she's no longer pleasant, whether it's Ruth, who, with, whose name comes from the ancient Semitic root of a literal companionship and friendship fidelity one to the other, or Pa, whose nape of the neck is going to turn against Naomi. All of these names that Chazal tell us about their midrash shemot, machlon chilyon, demise, destruction, disease, don't do this to your children. But basically what we see is paying attention to a name, but it's not just going to be the names themselves, it's going to be a theme of a name. Do people have names? 
And notice again the end of Sefer Shuftim. We don't hear of any names other than Micha. We don't hear about the name of a concubine. We don't hear about the names of the warriors. We don't even hear the name of the lady. No one has a name. No one is given recognition. Part of the challenge of Sefer Ruth. And what we basically see is that the prototype of Chesed is going to be giving people a name, providing an identity. And we're going to see that there are two explorations or two expressions really of how one achieves and maintains identity. Well, what has happened though? Naomi, we hear in the exposition, has left together with her husband, only to, to be bereft of her husband and then bereft of her two sons after 10 years after they've intermarried with the people of Moab. They've left the bayit of Lechem, literally a house of bread, to go to the fields of Moab, notoriously known for not providing bread for the people of Israel. And after Naomi is left alone, no, no husband, no children, she could wallow in depression. What does she do? She gets up. Just like in the book of Shoftim, we hear that Dvorah calls the general of the time to save them from the oppression of the Canaanites. She calls Barak and she says, you know, God has told you that you're supposed to initiate a war against the Canaanim. And he says, but I'm scared to go. Will you go with me? And Dvorah, who really could say, do you know that I'm a judge? Do you know that I have to take care of the social welfare of the people? She gets up to meet that challenge. Similarly, in Sefer Shmuel, we hear about Elkanah and his wives. And then after telling Hana, maybe we should be content with the status quo of not having children, Vatakom Hana. Hana gets up to change her trajectory. And albeit, literally, Naomi could have stayed in Stay Moav, Vatakom. This story, even more than being about Ruth, is really about Naomi. It's about Naomi's initiative for the future. It's about her changing the current situation. And this is a message for any time period. This is a message for any frustration that we have. And what does she do? The next light motif, we hear the words, Vatasha, Vatasha, Vlashuv. She's going to return. And what is she returning to? She says very clearly, I'm returning from Stemoav. I'm returning not just to the land of Israel, not just to Beit Lechem. I'm returning to the place wherein a relationship between God and the people of Israel will be manifest by God providing for food. She wants a relationship with God. She wants to restore the relationship with God that she forfeited. And therefore, she gets up to leave. And as her daughters-in-law accompany her, she says, no, you don't understand. I'm not just going to a new place. I am performing tshuva. I am repenting. I am going back to my source. I'm restoring a relationship with God. For you, it's not restoration. For you, if you want to perform tshuva, go back to your heritage. Go back to your home. Go back to your parents. And initially, they both insist, no, we'll return with you. And she says, that doesn't make any sense. And therefore, Ruth is finally, in her tenacious expression, going to tell Naomi, if it means that I have to adapt, your God is my God, your people is my people, your land is my land, then that's what I'll do. And we have to ask ourselves, as we look carefully at this verb of vatasha, vatasha, we notice that it appears 12 times, six times in the direction of returning to stay Moab, to those foreign fields of Moab, and six times regarding returning to Beit Lechem. And we realize that it's not a dialectic. It's not a debate for Naomi. She already has the clear, she's returning to Beit Lechem. What the author is telling us is that this is an internal struggle transpiring now in the heart and mind and consciousness of Ruth. Is she going to do with the easy thing to go back to her country, to go back and regain her identity in her land where she grew up? Or is she going to forfeit her entire past for the sake of allegiance, fidelity, recognizing that it's dangerous for Nomi to return alone? And what does she do? Even if Nomi will not speak to her perhaps the entire journey, she will return, she will accompany basically, Naomi's return. She is the greatest supporting history and all, supporting actress in all of Tanakh and all of Jewish history. She is going to forfeit everything so that Naomi can have her tshuva to God. And sure enough, Atash of Naomi, the root of Kalata, Ima Hashava Miste Moab, as Naomi returns to the fields of Moab, Hema Ba'u Beit Lechem. And no one pays any attention to Ruth. Hazot Naomi, they say, but everyone ignores Ruth. She doesn't have an identity here. And the author tells us, but don't worry, 
Look at this, also seasonally, it's the beginning of the barley harvest. It's the beginning, basically, of the time of Pesach. It's the beginning of Gu'ula. There's hope, not just spring in the air. And sure enough, we now proceed with the next scene. Naomi left Stay Moab to come back to a bayit, and she thought she would come back to a home, but instead, what does she come back to? She comes back to literally an empty home, a broken home, a forsaken home. She comes back and there's no food to eat in the bayit. So what has to happen in Parakbet? In Parakbet, we find that Ruth is going to volunteer to go off instead, to go to the fields, to go to the fields of Beit Lechem. She leaves that bayit and instead is going to go all alone to a field, to fields that remind us of the fields of Yitzchak and Rivka, to the fields that aren't really just a fields of fate, they're fields of destiny. We know that fields in Tanakh, a field in Sefer Breshit, is the place that God has created with the potential for Esav and Zesheva, Adam Ayin, La Vodet Adama. But man has not yet worked the ground. For a field is a place where God sets the scene and waits for man to do something. And what is God waiting for man to do here? Well, Naomi is busy looking in the yellow pages or today on Google to find who's the Goel, who, as we see in Vayikra Perak Chafhei, is the closest relative who has the financial responsibility to purchase the field so that the indigent relative has what to survive off of, and then knowingly will have the field return to that original event, original family member in a Yovel year. So while she's busy looking for the Goel, it's Ruth who's going to say, I'm going to make things happen. I'm going to go out to the fields. And when she goes out to the fields, Boaz recognizes her. And Boaz asks his Na'ar Hani Tzaval HaKotrim, one of the only characters in the entire book of Ruth who doesn't have a name because he doesn't deserve a name, because he doesn't provide Ruth with a positive name. Instead, he calls her the Moabite who's been here all day, who returned from Moab with Naomi. Oh, she has an identity, all right, but a foreign identity. You don't want to have anything to do with her. And yet Boaz does. And he says to her, he says, may God reward you for what you have done. You have done a tremendous chesed. You have basically forfeited your entire past. You have, as we see, mim mimicked more or less the same lech lecha of Avram Avinu. And therefore, the words are supposed to remind us one of the other. Just like he says, <speaking in Hebrew> These words resonate with Avram saying, Hashem took me, me, beit avi, me, eret moladeti. This is a story wherein Boaz recognizes what Ruth has done. And what has she done? Yes, she's forsaken her entire past for the sake of Nomi's chuba. But now we hear it's not just for her chuba, it's also for her gula. It's also for a long-term redemption. She comes home, not only with plenty of food, but she tells Naomi, do you know that Boaz is even going to let me stay in the fields for all these weeks of the harvesting? And Naomi, who thought that God was out of the picture, Boaz brings God back into the picture. Baruch Hashem. And Naomi also says, Baruch Hu Hashem. Asher lo azav chasto et hachayim ve'et hameitim. Wait a second, God really is here in the scene. And through Ruth, she's able to see that, through Boaz's acts of kindness. And Ruth even says, then why are you performing these acts of kindness? And Boaz says, because you've inspired me. Because you've done something for this woman without any reward. I'm going to give you something. Also not expecting anything in return. And Naomi realizes that who's also performing a chesed this entire time? It's God. God will make sure that it's not just the short-term food that he provides for but wait a second, what's going to happen? Even if she has enough food to survive off of, she has no heir. She has no one to inherit the land, the land that carries the name of Elimelech, Machlon, and Chilion, the legacy of generations galore going back to Yitziat Mitzrayim. And therefore, she wants someone who's going to purchase the land and keep the name of the person on the land. But wait a second, that's not the halacha. As we find in Vayuka Perachafei, is that someone just has to purchase the land. In Dvarim Perachafei, we hear about another halacha called Yibum, wherein 
one also purchases a widow, so to speak, so that the child can inherit the land and the name. And the Ramban points out that in Sefer Ruth, it's really not a story of Yibum. There aren't any surviving brothers. It's not a Leverite marriage. Rather, what is it? He says, it's a story of Gula. It's really purchasing a field, but it's done in such a way that the spirit of the law of Yibum is going to be kept, kept as well, Benekrashimo be Israel, so that there is a Hakamat Shem be Israel. This isn't a message just during the time of the Shoftim. This is the timeless message, a message of giving people identity. And maybe that's why this year it's all the more timely, as we're all in our homes, as we all somehow and our identity is almost erased. And even now, on the Zoom chat, I can even change my identity if I'd like. I can go in and enter a different name entirely. And you may not even know, again, who is this person? No interaction with the person. And what does Boaz do? He goes out of his way to provide an identity through making sure that there's survival, making sure that she has groceries, making sure that someone's looking out for her. And Ruth, what is she going to provide for? When Naomi, in the next chapter, is going to ask her to forfeit her future, Ruth is going to agree to do this as well. What does Naomi request of Ruth? Go down to the Golan, she asks of her. Again, go down. Anna, basically, in a very presumptuous manner, propose to Boaz that he should not just purchase our field that he should also purchase you, that he should marry you, and this way have a child who will inherit the land of Elimelech and thereby have a name. And Ruth agrees to forfeit her future. Or as Boaz says, hey, tav min minharishon. This second chesed is even greater than the first chesed that you performed. The first one was forfeiting your past like Avraham Avinu. This one, you're forfeiting your future like Avraham at the time of the Akedah. Because you could go off and live with this, anyone else. And instead, you're coming to me. You're coming to the Goren in the middle of the night. You're coming to this man. And Chazal tell us he was an older man by that time. You're coming and you're forfeiting your prospects of the future so that Naomi will not just have short-term tshuva, but she'll have long-term gu'ula. Wow. Wow. How can I not respond to that? How can we not be inspired by those in every generation who remind us of the chesed of God, those who are all about changing the trajectory of the people without even thinking of the long-term ripple effects. And therefore, notice how Shmuel Hanavi writes the story. He says, when did this all happen? It happens in the Goren. It happens in the Goren between the Sadeh and the Bayit. We're not yet back in the Beit Lechem. We haven't yet rebuilt a home, but we're getting there. We're getting there by going from the open fields where everything is really up to God, the control of God, and man acts. Now it's going to be up to man all the more. We're slowly getting back to that area of a bayat where man again can control his environment. And when does this happen? By hibachati halayla. There's only one other time in all of Tanakh that this phrase appears. By hibachati halayla. Many amazing events happen at midnight. Again, whether it's stories of Shimshon that happen at midnight, Abraham Avinu saves at midnight, Daniel has visions at midnight. Again, Achashverosh can't sleep at midnight, and yet. Only one other story that happens at midnight. And that, as you know, is the story that we remember every single day. The parallel story of a timeless message. The message of Yitziat Mitzrayim. The story that reminds us how God is the one who took us out of Egypt. How God, through bombastic miracles, saved Am Yisrael. The night that reminds us of literally a divine debut of God to the Jewish people. The night wherein we became a people, the birthday of Am Yisrael. The night wherein Paro finally said, leave already with your tone and bakar, but bless me on your way out. The night where we didn't even have time to prepare for our own food. And the author says, there are going to be other Bahati Halailas. Do you want to know what's parallel to that amazing night that you left Egypt? Bahi Bahati Halaila, go to the Goren. You think that this is just a story of people in a field. You think that this is a banal story. This is one of the most religious stories. This is the most timeless story that has to be incorporated in our daily lives because this is the story that will change history. This is actually a story, not only a personal gula, this is a national gula. And when you think of national redemption, true, you think of, I'm sure, the story of the Exodus from Egypt, but don't. Don't just think about that. Think of this story. Think of this story, Bahati Halaila. 
when a woman comes to a man. Think of the story where the man is able to show restraints. Think of the story wherein instead of Pyro sending us out and asking us for a blessing, it's Boaz who blesses Ruth. This story wherein instead of Hashem lifting us up on wings of eagles, Ruth turns to Boaz and says, don't wait for God to spread his wings upon me and reward me. You reward me. You spread your, your wings of eagles. Don't wait for the redemption from God. You catalyze the process. This is going to be a story wherein, as opposed to the Egyptians who, after years of oppressing us, don't even send us out with food or give us even the time to prepare our food, Boaz says, wait before you leave in the morning, I'm going to provide you with food. I'm going to provide you with uh, the Shei Sa'orim. I'm going to provide you so that you don't leave empty-handed, just as God didn't want us to leave empty-handed from Mitzrayim. And if God is the one who provided us with matzah and then ultimately with man, as we left Egypt this time, it's going to be human beings. This is the message of Ruth. You make miracles happen. And sure enough, Boaz says, if you were willing to do this, then even though I'm not the next king in line to redeem you, I will make sure that not only will your field be redeemed, Ruth, but you will be redeemed. I will make sure that Naomi has her gu'ula. I will make sure that you have a name and that she has a name and your children have a name and a name that's going to be connected to the land. And therefore, Boaz, as we know, in the fourth and final chapter of Ruth, the very next morning, is going to go to the Sha'ar and is going to insist to Ploni Almoni, who also doesn't deserve a name because he's willing, he's not willing to forfeit in his own name so that someone else can have a name. So he doesn't get a name in the end. Instead, he says, you know what, Boaz? You redeem. And Boaz says, again, even though technically you really don't have to marry the woman, but that's how you're going to fulfill the spirit of the law of Hakamat Shem Hamit. And therefore, Boaz insists, if you want this field, which is a great long-term investment because you get to basically hold on to it forever because there is no inheritor of Nomi's land, but provide for that inheritor. Provide for that heir. Make sure that there is a shame. And because Boaz, in the end, is going to be willing to provide that name, not only does he get a name, not only does he have a son, whom everyone calls Oved and recognizes that here is a story of people who are so selfless that they'll give up their identity so that someone else can have a long-term identity. That's not just a story of Malchut. That's a story of Gula. That teaches us how redemption can happen. There's a beautiful poem that I think summarizes these ideas for us with regard to what the story of Ruth is all about. Yitzchak Shalev a wonderful Israeli poet, in fact, says and speaks about this. He says, when you open up Tanakh, you hear of cries, cries of Rachel Imenu in Ramah, Kol Ramah Nishma. You hear of the beautiful Tehillim of David. You hear about the banging of the drums of the Treyasar of the 12 prophets rebuking Am Yisrael. You hear about, again, literally the chills of Eov as he takes the pottery in order to relieve himself of uh, the torture of his skin. And then Olafata, to Mama, Noam. In the middle of the drama, in the middle of coronavirus, in the middle of... Uh, and some of the most amazing and yet at the same time notorious stories of Tanakh. There's a scene, a scene of just three people, three people who will change the entire spirit of the times, three people who act with their pleasantries, no one who's screaming and the gates, no one crying out of pain, just a man who brings God into this very secular story, a God who calls out Hashem Machem, and everyone answers, Yibarachacha Hashem, someone who understands how to change, literally, the entire culture of a generation, bringing God into the picture. Ki Ashar Kol Ha'am Ha'oved, the one who will bring Oved into the picture as well. Loti Dat Shnat Lot, a man who doesn't sleep at night while he's in his Goren, this is a story wherein you can even smell the fragrance of the summer in the Gorin. You can smell the harvest. And uh, it's a story where this, there is a king in, the elders of the generation who are so passive, but then three people, the Goel HaGoel, and then there is someone who will bring redemption. Eloka Notein Helayon. And then God comes back into the picture. 
to finish off the scene with a child, and not just one child, but the Toledot of David. The last and final time, the 12th time in Tanakh that we have the word Toledot. After 10 times it appears in Sefer Bereshit to teach us about the formation of a nation, and then again in Sefer Shemot to teach us about the formation of the priestly line, now we hear about monarchy. This is going to be the last stage. The stage of Toledot that comes about just through people's chesed. People who bring God back then into the scene to provide for children. And the shechenot, the neighbors who name him and give him identity. This is a story not like Hayan and Hevel. You're not going to hear about any murder. You're not going to hear about Achav or Eov. It's almost as if the Tanakh took a rest from drama and screaming and crying and rebuke and instead brought us down to the Sadeh and the Goren in the middle of the night. It's a story, in fact, of how we're going to understand the nature of Geula. Why is this a timely message? It's a timely message because it reminds us that even though things or phenomena seem very stark right now, even though there doesn't seem right now to be a way out of this time period and pandemic, and we're all just waiting, waiting for this vaccine, waiting for social distancing to end, come along three people and tell us that you can make it end. Tell us that it's about chesed. This is what's going to catalyze the stages of Gula. Chazal tell us beautifully, that Hashem was basically waiting around, says Rabbi Eliezer. Hashem says, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for Melech Yisrael. I'm waiting for Malchut. I'm waiting for Mashiach ben David. And then what happens? Boaz asad shelo. Virut asad shela. Vinalmi asad shela. Hashem was waiting for us to act. And then Hashem says, Afani ese echeli. Now it's time for me to come into the picture as well. But Hashem waits. Hashem waits during every time period. And why is this timeless? It's not just a story of the seasons. As the Abu Raham says, well, this is when we're all harvesting. So let's read about the story of kindness and the harvest. But it's not just about harvest. It's not just about a story that brings us from the time period of Pesach and Shir Hashirim and the romance that comes from God to us. It's not just a time from bombastic miracles back to and the basic nature and the harvesting of our Bikurim. It's not just a time of the romance of Shir Hashirim to more than one can even argue the legal aspects of marriage that we find in Sefer Rut. It's timeless because it's about the day in, day out. It's not about the flowers of Shir Hashirim and the blossoming of beauty of Shir Hashirim. It's about the seed. It's about the zera. It's about the se'orim. It's about literally the basics of what the Jewish people are about. And that's why we're going to read it now. That's why we read it at the same time that we say Nasa v'nishma anu every year. We say Nasa v'nishma, we're accepting upon ourselves the word of God. And now from the most difficult to the easiest, so to speak, of the mitzvot, because we recognize that this is what accompanies us. Kehen chayenu v'orech yamenu. And what is that? That's the day in, day out. Not only ben adam l'makom, but ben adam l'chaviru. When we go to the fields, when we go to the supermarkets, are we still with masks on our faces? Are we now going to be able to give people identities and see them in a different light? Are we going to be able to be like Boaz, who says to Ruth, Mi'at, tell me who you are. And she's shocked. No one's asking who I am. Everyone just qualifies me as a Nechuya, as a Moabia. And that's why Chazal tell us, look at this beautiful Midrash on Mishlei. When Shlomo Melech writes, Eshet Chayel Miyimsa, who's truly a woman of valor? Well, Boaz is called a Gibor Chayel. And Ruth is called an Eshet Chayel, wonder, wonderful Shidduch and sure enough, together, they're going to perform wonderful strength, and they're going to provide for the perpetuity of the line of Yehuda, the line of Beit David, in Eretz Yisrael, but they're going to do something else. They're going to serve as the antithesis for the people of the time period of the Shoftim, who were known as great warriors, warriors, people of valor, 
not people of military strength, it's people of character. This is the message. Eshet Chayel, each one of the Psukim Chazal explain refers to a different attribute of one of the different female personalities in Tanakh. This is Sarah who trusted Abraham Avino. This is Rivka who performed Gemilut Chesed and happened to also fall off of a Gamal. And we're waiting. Who's going to get that greatest accolade? Rabot Banota Suchayel Vatalita Kulana. Chazal say, who is that? Who is the one who has the greatest? position, atalita kulana, who supersedes everyone else, zorut ha Ruth, who everyone else called a Moabite, in the end, nechnesa tachakanfei hashchina, she didn't wait for anyone to bring her in, she brought herself under the wings of God, and she showed and inspired Boaz that he can do the same, not to wait for the miracles of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but to make the miracles happen, to catalyze the process of Gula during this time period then, after the Gu'ula of Mitzrayim, Hashem says, I took care of that one. And now, starting Shavuot, but it can be the day before, it can be three days before, it can be the day after. This time, you make the miracle happen. And you should be the ones to facilitate and to propel the chasadim inspired by these people of their generation. You could also bring about Shuba and Gu'ula and ultimately the restoration of a bayit of Beit Malchut David. Wishing you all an inspiring, uplifting Chag HaGu'ula Ava Chag HaKatsir of Zman Matan Taratino. Thank you all. And Rabbi Maskin, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to learn with everyone. Thank you so much for a magnificent shir. And a uh, Chag Sameach to you and to your husband and to the entire family. Thank you so much for sharing with us your Torah.